Dr. Deganji, welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. I'm super fascinated by your work. I thoroughly enjoyed reading your book, Energy Rising. And I'd love to start with a quote from your book that I think will serve as a great place for us to set the stage for our conversation. And the quote is this, it says, and what I have come to understand as one of the greatest paradoxes of life, the depth of your emotional power relies on your ability to work with the energy of your emotional pain. If you could unpack that, I think the audience would really appreciate that. I'd be happy to. So if you think about the way our lives work, when we're having good days, and good days are always defined by good emotion, and that's fundamentally what they are. Things feel easy. Things feel satisfying. We feel connected to the people around us. We feel safe. We feel non-rushed. So on those days, life is just kind of running itself. Like we have enough momentum, like all the things around us are working for us. But if we want to become more powerful in this lifetime, if we want to become more confident, more self-possessed, more self-confident, we have to understand that the edge of our expansion begins at the beginning of those feelings we're always so desperate to avoid. So it really becomes how do we come into a different relationship with stress? with frustration, with anxiety. And I think that the deepest one of all is how do we come into a deeper relationship with our own inadequacy? And it's only when we like are willing to kind of look at it that we can expand through it. And I think a lot of people in the personal development space, they're already familiar with some of this where you have to be kind of responsible for a lot of your past and a lot of your imperfections and the things that kind of in a way, weigh you down and learning how to navigate those in a healthier way and learn how to, to, to pattern, interrupt and change those. But for somebody who's maybe just freshly diving into this, what are some steps they can take to understand what their inadequacies are that are you know driving a lot of the you know, unhealthy behaviors in their life? Yeah. I mean, such a fantastic question. There's a lot of ways we can answer it. So I'll riff for a bit and then you, you follow up. So I think the, the very first step is to first understand that so many of us since our childhoods have been pushed out of our emotional energy, right? So just think about how, how the parent-child relationship goes a lot of times. It's like, sit down. Well, I want to stand up. Be quiet. Well, I want to talk up. Go tell her you're sorry. Well, I'm not really sorry. So from our earliest kind of experiences, we're being kind of pushed to avoid a relationship with our emotional energy. So your question is, how do people start this work? And the simplest answer I can give is to slow down and pay attention to the body. So all emotions are, they're, they're literally neuro, neurochemical impulses in your brain that are talking to you through your body, through your nervous system. So a lot of times something will happen and we will have a reaction. And then we are a million miles away, you know, we, we are we're shutting down or we're fighting or we're, instead of looking at what actually happened in my body. Okay, I, I have a, a tightness in my throat. My heart is speeding up. Well, why is it happening? Right, and I think when we start to slow down long enough to ask the questions, I just had something happen to me this morning right before your show. Somebody sent me an email and I didn't like it. And so right away, I had that impulse to like fire back, set the record straight. But I had to stop myself and say, what am I really at, at the deepest core reacting to? I didn't like the email. Why didn't I like the email? I didn't like the email because I thought that they were saying I wasn't really important. So with that, that feeling in my body, if I'm going to be really direct, the feeling is a feeling of humiliation. Like they must not think I'm important. They must think I don't really matter here. They must think I'm stupid. If I would have responded to that email without first getting in touch with what my emotions were actually doing, can you see how quickly it goes off the rails? So it's like, let me just ask myself, what is happening in my own inner world? That alone is something that very rarely do we give ourselves the space to do. Do you ever find that it can be unhealthy when, when people get triggered or they go through a situation like you just explained to just always go back to, I mean, I'm not saying that you did, but, but a lot of people will be like, well, it's be, this happened because of something in my childhood. This happened because of something my mom said to me, my dad said to me. Do you ever think we, it reaches a point where people need to just kind of put that away and just focus on the here and now? 
A hundred percent. But the question is, how do you get to the here and now? Right. So, you know, I do a lot of coaching with people and I do a lot of therapy. So I have a clinical caseload and then I also do coaching and people want to heal. But and healing, like none of us have a time machine. We can't go back and fix the past. And I think a great metaphor, a great analogy here is like a lot of times there's this early injury and it's like a piece of glass in our foot. If we're really committed to healing, what we do is we go and we get the glass out of our foot. But a lot of times we're talking about the fact that there's glass in our foot or we're remembering the time that we stepped on a piece of glass. But in order to be in the here and now and to be fully healed, we need to get the glass out. So do I think that sometimes people can ruminate and perseverate on things that happen in childhood? Yes. But if they're ruminating and perseverating on things in childhood, they haven't really healed the injury. Because what they're really saying is if this is still, if I'm feeling right now like I'm behaving in a way that's dysfunctional in my life and it's because of something that happened to me 30 years ago, you can hear the victim consciousness in that. So I'm still signaling to, to myself and to the world. I'm still disempowered. I still can't figure this out. I still don't have agency. So I think in order to get to the here and now, we really kind of have to clean these, these emotional channels in our life. So how can somebody, if they're, if they're listening to this, how can they begin to reconfigure these emotional channels and heal from that pain so that they can get present and focus on the here and now without um, being highly triggered from their past? Well, I think let's just go back to this example, like, because we've all had this, so we get an annoying email, right? We get real triggered. And there's even a part of us sometimes that's like, okay, we, I sort of know I'm overreacting. So what's this really about? But what I'm saying, what I said before is just like, how can you slow yourself down and say, let me just ask the question, what beyond what is happening to me in real time is also contributing to my reaction? So let me, let me explain this. So one of the things I talk a lot about in my work is the difference between situation and sensation. So situation is like, you just made a really annoying comment to me. Situation, that was a really frustrating email to get. Sensation is, I feel inadequate. I feel pissed off. I feel irritated. All of your problem is happening in the emotional system. In other words, the, the, the comment doesn't matter until you have a bad feeling about it. The, the email doesn't matter until you have a bad feeling about it. So I think it's really this idea of how do I come back to sensation and start saying, what is this situation really triggering? It's triggering feeling and then working at the level of feeling. That makes sense. Um, I think getting in touch with that side of things and really being able to understand the distinct, distinction between the two is incredibly important. And I, I think like, a, a lot of your work, it seems, it really focuses on the fact that a lot of emotional pain comes from this notion of self-division, of, of self-betrayal, and, and doing things that we don't want to do, but we do them anyhow. Um, explain why you believe this is at like the, the crux of a lot of emotional pain and some steps that people can take to kind of come back to a place of, of wholeness. Absolutely. So a lot of, I would say overwhelmingly, first, let me just put this caveat, is I, I'm fundamentally a trauma expert. So I've treated a lot of trauma. Trauma is absolutely a real thing. Horrific things are done to us, okay? That said, a massive amount of pain in our life comes from exactly what you said. I use this term self-division, the way that we divide ourselves from ourselves. What does this mean? I'll give you a lot of examples. So. I really want to speak up, but I keep my mouth shut. I really want a new relationship with boundaries. Like I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm really going to start saying no to things. But then when push comes to shove, I say yes. I really want to rest. I am so exhausted. I want to rest. What do I turn around and do? I overwork. In each of those instances, I have divided myself quite literally from myself. In other words, my emotional energy is going in one direction. My emotional energy is saying, hey, Julia, or, or hey, Doug, please say no. And then my behavior says yes. My emotional energy is saying it's time to rest. My behavior goes in the exact opposite direction and overworks. And so you can see, I mean, it becomes almost quite literal. It's like you're this engine trying to make your way through life. And instead of having your behavioral and your emotional system work together, 
you really weaken yourself. You weaken yourself and you become so much more brittle when you divide your energy in these ways instead of really having this reverence for the emotional system. You know, a really powerful question for us all to ask ourselves is, do we believe that our emotions are just kind of a throwaway energy? Like we just feel what we feel and we feel it or, and it's, and it is what it is. Or do we believe that across 350 million years of evolution, it's this wildly powerful GPS system of our lives? It is only your emotions that tell you what things you want more of and what things you want less. It is only your emotions that tell you how much work is enough work, how much money is enough money, how much attention is enough attention. So again, it's kind of what I said to your earlier question. I think a lot of us have got a lot of messages in our life. Don't pay attention to your emotions, shut your mouth. And then when we get that message for long enough, the body starts to lose this intelligent connection to the emotions. And I, I want to get into the to, to the nuance of that because like how does somebody then let's just staying on the overworking example let's just say that somebody they're stressed out because maybe their job isn't going the way that they want they're having trouble at home they're stressed out with the kids and they need to make money like they need to work but they're just so shut down from a stress and emotional perspective that. I guess it would seem like to them, the logical thing to do wouldn't be to rest because they need to provide for their their family. They need to keep persevering and pushing through. And I think that situation is, is fairly common. How would you suggest somebody you know navigate through that in a healthy manner? The reason that life is so complex is because it's so complex, meaning I get that there are multiple sort of interests competing at once. But I want to make this point, and it's, it's a pretty deep point. And so like I'll, I'm happy to explain it more. In order to understand how we're moving ourselves through our lives, we have to understand what the brain really is, okay? And the best way to think about the brain is as a pattern detection machine. So your brain is running you through your life going apple, apple, fill in the blank, apple. Banana, banana, fill in the blank, banana. Or the way this sounds in an emotional context is like, things never work out for me. Things never work out for me. Things never work out for me. I always get what I want. I always get what I want. I always get what I want. So what tends to happen, because I help a lot of people with overwork, this is a really, really big paradigm shift. Remember how I said it's not the situation, it's the sensation? If I feel that the sensation that is going to keep me safe is the sensation of overwork, in other words, the way I know I'm safe, this is so big, the way that I know that I am safe is because I'm exhausted, because I'm frazzled, because I haven't sat down, because I don't, I never go to bed on time. The brain will say, even though this is making you feel miserable, Julia, you need to continue to achieve not the situation. You need to continue to achieve the sensation because it's the emotional sensation that then is therefore familiar, which then means I'm safe. So then the question becomes like, am I really overworking just out of economic necessity? Or is there a big part of this is that The way that I feel familiar is to continue to do familiar things, even when they make me feel miserable also. If you don't work at the level of emotion, you will never, ever change your situations. Why? Because the brain is a pattern detection machine that is running on the energy of your emotion. So then how can somebody begin to pattern interrupt some of this stuff like you just talked to, like take take away the situation that somebody is in dire straits or somebody needs to provide for their kids. They just went through something where they're like, you know what, like I need to make money now and this is why I'm doing it because I need to pay the bills versus the person that you're talking about that just consistently just overworks and overworks to get to that level of psychological and emotional homeostasis where they feel normal. How can people begin to you know, unlearn some of that stuff? So I think a very powerful technique is to work at the level of the pattern. Now, the pattern is, again, again, going to be an emotional pattern, and emotions are very strong, but they're also very simple. So the part of your brain that thinks is a different part of your brain than feels emotion, okay? So emotions are emotions. They're not, they're not cognitive processes. So there's patterns that govern our life. A lot of times we call this personality. So, for example, like, I am a good girl. I am a good boy. I am a hard worker. I am disorganized. I am organized. So we have all these, like, very kind of simple but powerful pattern. 
if we really want to change this, regardless of where we are in our life, regardless of the situation, the situational circumstance before us, and I have worked with people who have endured, I just want to give you a little bit of context of some of the the people that I've worked with across 20 years. I have worked with combat veterans. I have worked with torture survivors. I have worked with survivors of gun violence. I have worked with extraordinary, extraordinary domestic abuse. So lots of addiction, lots of trauma. So I, um, I think very intimately understand how traumatizing our lives can be for us. The whole thing about what trauma is though, it's never about the, the real trauma, not the, the single event that happened to us. The real trauma is this pervasive pattern that the world is unsafe. The world is unsafe. I can never get what I want. I will never get a break. No one will ever protect me. I don't have the... It becomes this very, very catastrophic, simple, but kind of all-encompassing pattern. So to go back to your question, like, what would I work on? I would work on what I call this idea of building a power pattern. So the power pattern is, you know, it's going to be a really simple thing. It's like, no matter how hard it is, I'm going to show up with my best. Even when I don't see it, I believe that things are working out for me. I am my own greatest advocate. So then when all these situations start to happen in my life that really kind of test me, do I have, do I have a central frame to bring these circumstances through? Going back to what you said like a, a few minutes ago, I feel like what people have a hard time with as far as like feeling safe in the world and being able to to navigate this 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 life and feeling like the world is against them and the people are against them is this idea of uncertainty and i think that's what trips people up and that prevents them from wanting to or believing in their ability to do that work so how how can people be able to healthily navigate the uncertainty of making these changes and of the world and where they're going to be to be able to continue on this path of healing. I think that you're totally right. Like uncertainty, it's it's the human brain has a very strong allergy to uncertainty. It makes us miserable. You know, I can tell you in, in laboratory studies, I just think this is really interesting to show you how powerful it is. When we put people in conditions where there is a machine that gives you an electrical shock and you're in a condition where you're absolutely going to get the shock, or you're in a condition where you may or may not get the shock. In other words, it's uncertain. People statistically prefer to be in the condition where they're absolutely going to get the shock. So what does that tell you? It tells you that quite literally, the emotional pain of uncertainty is more painful than physical pain. Because I'm going to actually take the shock for, for sure, rather than to sit with my stressful, uncertain feeling. So that's just to underscore how heavy uncertainty can be for the human brain is a lot of times when people feel like things are uncertain, they start over, I call it the overs, they start overdoing it. They start working, they overwork, or they overgive, or they trying to over-engineer. In other words, the way I'm going to fight uncertainty is I'm going to make everything around me as certain as possible. The problem with that is I don't actually think that certainty is the opposite of uncertainty. I think the opposite of uncertainty is self-trust. That no matter what happens in this situation, no matter if you like me or you don't like me or you, you go my way or you don't go my way, I'm going to be okay because I have emotional power. And all emotional power, you know, I, I wrote a whole book on emotional power. All it is, is am I able to lead myself even when it gets hard? I want to stay on this thread because I think it's something that people have, have a lot of trouble with. And I want to stay on the emotional power and uncertainty. You just touched on like why people struggle with with uncertainty and they end up turning to these vices, these over these quote unquote over vices to handle uncertainty, but it and in fact creates more unhealthy patterns and may make a lot of that stuff even worse, right? And then people prefer physical pain over the emotional pain of uncertainty. And you also mentioned that the opposite of uncertainty is self-trust. From my experience and a lot of the experience of the people that that I know are is that people don't struggle with uncertainty when things are good. When things are good, people are like, you know what? Like I got momentum, I'm making money, my relationships are going well, my health is great. Like I have no problems to worry about as far as the future. I just know that things are gonna be good because you're on the up and up. The problem becomes, I think, when people don't experience success 
and they've gone through a breakup, they've lost a job, they've had a health scare, fill in the blank, and their level of self-trust is pretty low based on their experience. So my question then is, how can somebody develop that self-trust that's the antidote to uncertainty in, in the moments where they're lacking self-trust the most? Okay, such a good question. I have a lot to say, so so I'll, I'll try to stay focused. So first of all, I think if we're really honest, we give ourselves plenty of reasons to not trust ourselves. So the world plenty of times legitimately does not cooperate with us. The world legitimately will break our hearts over and over again, okay? I mean, even even death and dying, like we know that the things that matter the most to us in this lifetime are going to be taken from us. That is like already a bad video game to play. You're like, no, I don't want to have that user experience. So I get that all the time, minor frustrations to crushing things happen to us. Let's put that aside. What I'm trying to say is that a lot of times we divide ourselves from ourselves irrespective of these external things. What do I mean by this? Let's say there's probably ways that I don't honor my commitments to myself. There's plenty of times I make a promise to myself. I don't, I don't hold that promise. So for example, I say, you know what? Let's say I'm, I'm having a lot of conflict in my house with my partner. And I say, you know what? I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to have this conversation anymore. And then tomorrow or the next day or the next week, I'm having the same conversation. I just said I wasn't going to have. Or I say, you know what? Like my body really doesn't feel good. I am going to walk for 15 minutes a day. I don't walk for 15 minutes a day. Now I have plenty of good reasons. The kids got too busy. My boss got too demanding. But can you see how part of my emotional system is saying to me, see, I knew I couldn't trust you. Because if I can only trust you when the going is easy, I'm not going to trust you. And what's so fascinating to me, I do a lot of work with couples, is we, sh- we have these expectations of our partners. So we say to our, our partners or our spouses or our husbands or our wives, we say, If I can't trust you in the bad times, then I don't want to trust you in the good times. So we make this wildly difficult demand of another adult human being for something, if we're being really honest, we don't even give to ourselves. So we make promises to ourselves. We betray ourselves. We don't hold ourselves accountable. And in these ways, that seems small, like it was just a 15 minute walk. It was just not having this conversation. But this this amounts to a lifestyle. I mean, of course, yeah, because how are you going to believe in yourself and how are you, how are you going to gain hope in yourself if you constantly are lying to yourself, right? I guess to follow up, then what is the solution then to building self-trust? If somebody's listening to this and they're like, Dr. Julie, I, I really don't trust myself right now. I know what I should be doing. I just don't do it. If I wanted to start tomorrow to rebuild trust with myself, like how, how do I do that? Great question. I would ask, where where don't you trust yourself? So first of all, let's talk about some of the areas. So I don't trust myself because I don't honor my commitments to myself. Well, where are those things? Like, where does it actually break down? Another reason that we don't trust ourselves is we tell ourselves we don't belong in the room. So we say, oh, this person's not calling because they don't really care about me. But I haven't called them. We say, you know, I, I really want to show up in a certain way on social media. Or I want to show up with my family. Or I want to show up on my friend. But nobody wants me there. Nobody told me that. I told myself that. So I would start to really take this kind of fearless inventory of the ways, where's my trust breaking down? What are the, what are the things I say I'm going to do that I don't do? What are the ways that I say I'm going to act that I don't act? And I, I would be very non-judgmental about it. Let me just kind of be curious and figure out where am I dividing myself from myself. So that once you gain that understanding, is there a certain protocol or a certain cadence to taking these steps that to, to help somebody build self-trust? So I just like the easy example I would say is the one that you talked about a few minutes ago, the 15 minute walk. And let's just say that that's an area that, that somebody is not staying committed to themselves. They want to do it. They just they get busy and they just end up throwing it to the side and it doesn't happen. Would the goal be then to switch to engaging in like a five in a five minute walk to just to build the habit and making making it more reasonable would it be to walk with a friend like what would be some things that could really help somebody address that absolutely so i think what's the most important thing to do is to show yourself that you can maintain a commitment to yourself daily so the the length of it doesn't matter it's really kind of the fidelity to the commitment 
So I say that I'm going to do, and you don't even have to say walk. If someone is really having a disturbed relationship with themselves, let's be really generous. There doesn't have to be any urgency to this. So every day I'm going to do something kind to myself. Here's the piece though, no matter what. And the reason no matter what is so important in this context is because what could possibly trump your willingness to be kind to yourself? It can't be your job. It can't be your kids. Our relationship with ourselves it's the whole idea of putting our own oxygen mask on first. So I would say, let's pick one small self-care activity and do it every day. It could be a walk. It could be making yourself a nice cup of tea. It could be look, not even making an appointment with a therapist, just looking at therapists. It could be buying a self-help book. So I think the idea here is really to get momentum. Like I am coming for myself. And here's the key to show myself evidence, not just theory, but I really have. And I would, I would like, you know, that we have all these smartphones. I would have a calendar and just like, or a little journal. And every day I would write down what I did to really get the sense of there's some momentum building. And so outside of keeping the commitments that you make to yourself and, and changing your habits, what are some other ways that people can uh, kind of destroy this, their pattern of self-betrayal um, to come back to a place of authenticity? Well, the deepest one is, again, to work on the emotional energy. So let's say I say I'm going to walk for 15 minutes a day and I can't do it. I promise you the reason is because I could, I could drop it down to five minutes. But if I can't give myself five minutes to like have a glass of water by a window and like take a few breaths, the reason isn't that I don't have enough time in my day. So remember, again, like a lot of times we'll make these situational excuses. And I have said a lot in my work, I have never heard a bad excuse. I mean that so sincerely. The amount of stress that we have in our lives, the amount of traumas that some of us carry in large part thanks to our childhood. I think the reasons it's hard to take care of ourselves are really good reasons in a lot of ways. But if I, let's go back to the simple idea. Let's say I was gonna spend five minutes with a cup of tea in front of a window, just breathing. If I can't do that, it's not because my schedule is so busy. It's because there's an emotional block and that emotional pattern detection machine I was telling you. The underlying pattern is you don't deserve five minutes. It's not safe to relax. A big one for those of us who've experienced significant trauma is sitting still with our thoughts is like a special hellfire, okay? So there's a, so then we start to say, okay, okay, it wasn't really about the window and the, and the cup of coffee for five minutes. Now I'm really starting to make conscious the real obstacle. The real obstacle is these core patterns. Now that it's, it's conscious, I can work on those. When we treat trauma clinically, the most effective way to treat trauma is to have people feel the feelings they have not allowed themselves to feel. So what's so beautiful about this work is there's not some complex 15 step thing what we're really trying to get to, and this is why I wrote the book, is if I allow myself to feel the feelings, the very feelings that I thought were the feelings that were going to destroy me, this becomes the moment of my liberation. And when I talk about extreme, I'm talking about combat trauma, sexual assault. If it's true at the most extreme forms of human suffering, of course, there's going to be some golden nuggets for those of us who don't have that extreme form of trauma. But it's like, I have to be able to sit with the feelings that I thought I couldn't feel. Otherwise, the brain is going to keep you running your entire life. But the thing you're running from is you. So it's an unsolvable math problem. How can I spend my whole life running from me? You can't really get the math on that to work. Okay, there's a couple of ways I want to go with this. I want to talk about trauma like in, in a little bit more in detail in a second. But first, I think just you know putting a bow on this conversation about self-betrayal and getting comfortable with the uncomfortable feelings and being able to embrace the, the discomfort of those sensations Let's just use a, an example of somebody who is afraid to go ask somebody out in the, in the, in public, right? I would say that is something that I've experienced back in, back in the day. And that a lot of people, they have a fear of that because it's like the fear of rejection, humiliation, uncertainty, all those things. And so what should somebody do if they start to feel the trembling, they start to feel the, I'm not good enough. I don't deserve this. This person's not going to like me. How does that person navigate? going forward once they, once they experience those com uncomfortable feelings? I, okay, I, I love this question. I call this the emotional shape. And what's really interesting is I'm going to make an analogy to physical health and it's going to be crystal clear to people because we all get it. When we go to the gym, 
and we're trying to get stronger. And if we've ever lifted anything heavy, we know that when we lift something that kind of pants the edge of what we can currently, how much power we currently have, our bodies will quite literally shake. Our muscles will shake, our biceps will shake, our, our whatever, any part of our body will shake when we test it in this way. When we go to the gym and our bodies shake, I have never heard of anyone freaking out, shutting down, running out of the gym, never to return ever again. In fact, there's plenty of us who we even enjoy that muscle shake because it's the clearest evidence that we're getting healthier and that we're getting stronger. Your emotional life, it works almost exactly the same. In other words, if I'm going to ask somebody out and I start to, my body's going to, my body might, again, quite literally start to shake. My voice might start to tremble. When I get nervous, I'm a handshaker. My hands will shake. My thoughts will start to race. But so many of us use that emotional signal, again, that signal in the nervous system, that that's a sign that we should flee never to return again, never have the conversation, never ask the person out. And then the worst part about it is then we come up with all these stories. Steve, I don't know what's wrong with you. You're never going to find a partner. You're so weak. You don't have... It just like we double down because we don't understand how to work with our, with our nervous system. What I tell people is like the, the emotional shake, it's an amazing thing because it means you're getting stronger. So you're going to go out there and your voice is going to shake and your hands are going to shake. No problem. I think the work here, the nervous system is going to do what the nervous system is going to do. In other words, it's not reasonable to tell somebody, especially if it's like the first one, two, three times that they're doing this. Don't sweat. That is going to make them sweat more. Instead, the message is, so what? Have you ever sweat before? Yes. Have you died from it? No. Okay. Have your hands ever shook before? Yes. Have you ever died from it? No. Okay. What happens though, and this is really important, just like your muscles get stronger, if I lift 20 pounds now instead of 10, I'm no longer shaking at 20. Our biology habituates. So if we go into a situation and ask somebody out every day or once a week, very, very quickly, the biology is really intelligent. And so it's going to learn how to be calm in those situations. But it needs that evidence. So in that situation, um, other than accepting the fact that those feelings are normal, and they're going to happen. Is there anything they can do in the moment? Like, is there something? I mean, should they like a look a certain direction? Should they like have a certain posture? Should they tell the person that they're nervous? Like, is there anything else that they can do that maybe can help mitigate the some of the like emotional discomfort? Absolutely. I think the key piece here, though, is really to allow the emotion. I think most of our misery and stress comes when we think we can't be nervous. Do you see what I'm saying? So like, I'm going to give a public speech. I'm super nervous. Don't be nervous about it. It makes me more nervous. So The first piece of this is really to say, it's just anxiety in my body. It's just zing, zing, zap, zap, zoink, zoink of my nervous system. And even that, it's going to be very, it's going to be very grounding. Okay. Right before you get into something, you can do fantastic grounding techniques. So a great thing is to take three breaths, really focus on the exhale, because that's going to always calm down the nervous system. So three big exhales and all you can do grounding techniques. So a great grounding techniques is I do three breaths and then I close my eyes and I think of three things I can hear and I think of three things I can feel. So now I've done two things. I've said, I'm going to, it's just anxiety in the nervous system. The nervous system was literally built to experience these feelings. I'm going to do some grounding. And the, and the third piece is really work with that pattern. The reason you're anxious is you're saying she probably or he probably doesn't want to go out with me. If I go in there with a different pattern and say, there's a lot of people on this planet, it's cool to experiment, I'm going to run an experiment. Do you see how those three techniques together give you a lot of spaciousness? Yeah, because and then it also, I think, takes away, it takes your to the attention off of like what you're actually doing. Like it takes your attention off asking that person out and now you're focusing on different senses. You're focusing on like the bigger picture as a whole and being like, all right, like I know there's plenty of people out there if this doesn't work out. So yeah, I definitely like understand like where you're going with that. And I think a lot of this, I imagine at the, at the core of all this, at the root of all this is, is the fear of humiliation and being humiliated and taking this all one step further. I know you talk about in your book that the precursor to worthiness is humiliation. 
talk about like how you can take something as painful as being humiliated and transcend it into um, worthiness. Absolutely. I think that humiliation is such a universal and destructive emotion. And I just want to kind of give your listeners a little bit of context. The reason that this really came through for me was like working in very different arenas and listening to how commonly people talked about humiliation. A very, very powerful one is I do a lot of work with combat veterans. And when they would come to me for treatment from trauma and PTSD, you know, PTSD has a lot to do with the fear-based pathology on some level. So I would, you know, as a civilian, I would think, I know what you're afraid of. You were afraid of dying combat. And they would say, yeah, you know, like that was not ideal, but that was not my greatest fear. My greatest fear was being the guy on the mission who didn't have it together, being the guy that other guys couldn't depend on, being the weakest guy in the group, being the guy who couldn't protect his friend, like over and over and over. I heard that a fate worse than death was this feeling of humiliation. And what humiliation really is, is it's a moral injury. It injures our spirit. Your brain is incredible, right? So your brain has really failed if it allows you to actually be humiliated. So what your brain is doing is it's doing this very hypervigilant thing where it's saying, don't say that, you might sound stupid. Don't do that, you might look dumb. Don't ask that question, maybe people won't understand. So it's just like constantly being obsessive about anything that might humiliate you. The problem with this, and this is actually, I wanted to say this in response to the last question you asked me. When we are anxious in our lives, a very natural response is to want to distract ourselves from the anxiety. So like, could I do a technique where I'm not anxious anymore? Like, could I turn on a song and dance? Yes, sure, sometimes. But the problem, the, 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 real, the real thing we want to build is emotional power. And if we want to build emotional power, what we talked about at the very beginning of the relation, in our conversation is the most important, which is, Our power depends on how much pain we can expand our nervous system to hold. So you don't want to keep avoiding and distracting. You actually want to show the emotion. You want to look the emotion in the eyes and say, I know what you are. You're just an emotion and looking at you is going to make me stronger. So a lot of times in terms of humiliation, we feel like I'm going to post this thing on social media. I'm going to make this comment. I'm going to apply for this job. I'm going to speak up and nobody's going to back me up. And we feel like it's just going to desecrate our sense of worth. And so because of that, we start to do a lot of these dysfunctional behaviors that can seem minor. So two great examples that I always give is lying and gossiping. Now, lying, I don't necessarily mean big, bold-faced lies. I mean little distortions of the truth, embellishing, telling little stories. A great example of this is the filters we use on social media. The only reason we use filters on social media is because we don't think the truth of what we actually are is acceptable enough. So I know you've been asking a lot, like, how does the rubber really hit the road for my listeners? So the way that we we can really build, reduce our sense of humiliation and really build this supreme power of, of emotional worthiness is to really take inventory in our life and say, where are we lying and where are we gossiping? And I'm certainly happy to talk about both of those in turn, but I'll stop there for a moment. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, this is so fascinating and it's so true that like, I think a lot of the path to building emotional resilience comes from exposure therapy and just putting yourself out there and working that muscle. Like you've, you've used the, the physical fitness and gym reference a couple of times during our interview so far, but when it comes to really building self-worth from not being afraid of being humiliated and not of being afraid of putting ourselves out there and being our true self, like how can you bring those two together? So an important thing to realize here, and this is, I think, this goes in a way back to the uncertainty piece and how difficult it is for us humans. But a a thing I want to like underscore is you cannot hold in evidence what you do not first hold in faith. Really think about that. I cannot hold in evidence what I do not first trust. So the part of us that feels like we can be humiliated is the smaller self. Here's what happens in human development. I want you to think about a baby, a big baby, a small baby, a light baby, a dark baby, a fat baby, a skinny baby. Have you ever looked at a baby and said, that baby is not worthy? 
for the overwhelming majority of us, we would say that baby is perfect. It's a perfect embodiment of life. So a very important question then comes. Don't even think about yourself because we're, we're, we, we're too kind of myopic on ourselves. When does that inherent worthiness wear off? Does it wear off the first time the baby poops in the diaper? Does it wear off at three years old? Does it wear off at 10 years old? You start to see very quickly, none of that makes any damn sense. This must then mean that the energy of life itself is imbued with the energy of worthiness. Well, if the energy of life is imbued with the the energy of worthiness, then this whole idea that I could be worthy or not worthy, I could be good or not good, I could be enough or not good. You can almost, when I say it like that, I could be a good girl or I could not be. It's childhood coding. It's this, I'm, it, it's the personality structure. What we have to now recognize in order to get to this, because you, you brought up this idea of the authentic self. The authentic self is the self that says, I am worthy. There's these three words again, no matter what. It's only the smaller self, this personality self that's saying, well, you're, you're good enough as long as you're a top performer. You're good enough as long as you have a job. You're good enough as long as you make X dollars. But that's not true. So what we have to be willing to do is test the edge of our emotional power, just like we would test the edge of our physical strength. Let me see if it's really true that I am unworthy if I don't show up to the meeting on time. If you don't run the experiment in your own life, it will always just be this abstract thing because your emotional system doesn't yet have access to the evidence. I think my question goes back to how do, how do they get to this place of feeling like authentically like worthy? Because I feel like, and in my experience, like I can say all day that I'm worthy of this, I'm worthy of that. But if like the results in life doesn't reflect that, it's super easy for me to be like, well, I guess I'm not worthy because- Hold on though. Tell me about the results in life. What is the results in life The dating example is an easy example, right? So if I just say that to myself that I'm worthy of love and that I'm worthy of a healthy relationship and I go six months without like a a string of healthy dates or a relationship with a, with a, with a healthy partner, even though I'm telling myself I'm worthy, like the, the, the results aren't there. So it would be easy for me to say, well, or it'd be easy for me to like, kind of think to myself, well, maybe I'm not worthy. I mean, yeah, I can keep going and keep going. I'm telling myself I'm worthy of something, but yet the, there's nothing that's around me that's reflecting that that's actually true. Does that make sense? I, it totally makes sense. I'd like to push back on the premise. I don't agree with the premise. So I, I'm saying there's kind of two selves here. One is kind of the personality self and one is kind of the true self. You, you kind of call it this thought that I totally agree with that. I think there's kind of the ego structure, like, you know, I, if people really, you know, this, this ego structure and then there's a more true self. When we talk about worthiness, worthiness has to be, if we really think about it from an emotional power standpoint, it has to be unconditional. It has to be, I am worthy, irrespective of condition. But how do we get to that place? Because I think that, I mean, I guess just in my experience, like you can say stuff like that all day long, but it's like, well, I, where's the where's the result or where's like the actions that kind of reflect that, you know? But if you say my worthiness is staked to outcome, even when you get outcome, you won't feel worthy. So in other words, if you say I am more, I'm worthy of good relationships. Well, that's just an example. I mean, that was just an example. Yeah, totally. And like, we can say if I don't have enough money in the bank account, if I don't, if I, if I lose my job, but the whole, the whole, I think a lot of us are out there doing that, but the setup is wrong. It's, It's the exact opposite direction. So it's saying I am worthy if there is X outcome. If you don't get X outcome, you're going to feel bad. But this is really important for your listeners too. Even if I do get X outcome, say I get X amount of dollars or say I get X amount of dates, I can feel good in that moment. But my emotional system, my system knows, yeah, you're safe for the time being, but you're not safe forever. Why? Because because your worthiness was contingent on outcome. So what we have to start to do, and this is, I get that this is very difficult, especially if we haven't been practicing in this. But what we have to be willing to do is to say, I am worthy no matter what. And the way, okay, so I don't, I don't feel that way right now. Why don't I feel that way right now? I can almost guarantee that there's spaces in your life where you're, I, I know this is a, is a bold word, but lying, which means just distorting my reality. And I, and, and I think gossiping. So like, if you don't like gossiping, say judging others. So, okay, if I don't feel unconditionally worthy, 
I want to say I'll feel conditionally worthy if I get a date. I'm saying that's not going to save you though. Because even if you get the date, you're going to know it's only a matter of time before the other shoe drops. Point one. Point two is if, I, okay, I want to feel more unconditionally worthy. What can I do to strengthen that muscle? I would say two things. Focus on where you're lying and where you're, where you're distorting reality and where you're judging. If you start to tone those things down, the, the inevitable consequence is kind of this wellspring, believe it or not. Like you start to clear out the emotional scar tissue and this, this sense of worthiness just rises within you. I love that you brought up like, how do you bring up your level of unconditional worthiness? Because that's what I was kind of getting at. I was just trying to say that like, I just don't know if it's as simple as somebody saying, yeah, I feel worthy and then not really doing anything, not addressing areas of their lives that they need to work on or whatever. You can't just, you know, talk your way into that. I think you have to, has to, some action on somebody's end has to follow that. Let's, let's talk about lying. Cause I think that's been a, a kind of a theme of the conversation has been the self betrayal coming back to our authentic self. How can somebody begin to like, address like where they're, they're lying to themselves and then, and then what are some pattern interrupts that somebody can do to begin to, you know, narrowing that gap between those two things. Great question. Everything begins with awareness. So the first thing, and a lot of us are doing this in such a patterned way that your brain is moving you now through your life in pretty unconscious ways, right? So until we say we're really going to look at our lives, our lives never transform, okay? So the first step is where am I lying? Now, lying is maybe too provocative a word. I love this idea of what is truth if it's not reality? So where am I breaking away from reality? So let's say my marriage and great. Do I go on social media and talk about how, how wonderful, how to have a great relationship and that you should emulate my relationship? If I don't really like the way I look and I, and I use a lot of filters, if I don't like certain people, here's a, here's a great one. I don't really like certain people, but when I'm around them, I act, I act really fake. That is self-division. You don't need to go out there and be rude or a jerk to another human being. That's not, that's not emotionally powerful either. But what I'm saying is everyone loves to talk about authenticity, but when the rubber hits the road, are we really emotionally powerful enough to tell the truth? And sometimes it's, it can be like, how can I tell this truth in a way that works for me? We don't need to go out there and complicate our lives. So let's say I was someone who talks about good relationships and I have, I'm struggling in my marriage right now. I could still do the work. I could say, hey, I'm someone who really wants to help you with relationships because I know how tough relationships can be. I can draw on a lot of struggles from my own relationship. I can draw on a lot of scientific expertise. It's when we pretend to be the shit that we're not, and then we don't understand why our lives feel so bad to us. Our lives feel bad to us because we're not actually embodying the very energy in our nervous system. And so then this is something else that I think is important to talk about. Then we talk about how everybody else is dangerous. This guy triggers me. That guy triggers me. She can't be trusted. He's a jerk. The dangerous person in the room is not them. The dangerous person in the room is me. If I'm the one who says, Julia, I will not stand by you. I will not. The truth of your life is too humiliating to be told. I am the one that's being dangerous to myself. So honesty, it seems like, is the best solution to becoming unconditionally worthy and also obviously honesty is obviously the opposite of lying so that would make sense for that but it's to really be authentic with the way that you post so if like you're somebody who is you know in debt three million dollars and you're posting online with you know your pri picture of a private jet and cars that aren't yours and you're like portraying this lifestyle that's that's really a completely opposite of what's actually true like you're going to feel even more horrible about yourself and you're going to convince yourself that you're a liar because the highlight reel isn't matching the full tape of the of the movie right and the same thing with the relate you see the thing with a relationship all the time like you can definitely tell when somebody's struggling in their relationship when they're constantly posting about it online i mean i i think that i think a lot of times what happens is when people are struggling in their relationship they'll constantly post about it to kind of cover up the fact that they're hurting at home the other thing I want to add here is we don't have to like, we can tell our stories in an empowered voice. I think the example I gave of like, let's go back to the relationship one, like say I want to do relationship coaching. I don't think I have to be like, oh my God, my life is over and I'm a loser. I can't. Honesty means how can I speak truthfully in a way that's empowering? So maybe I like, like I said in my early example, I go out there and say, I want to lead people through relationships because I understand how painful it is 
when we are really hurting in our marriages or in our in our romantic relationships. And I'm going to talk to, to you about this from my own my successes and my challenges. And I'm going to draw on the science. And it's like, I don't know where we got this idea that if we aren't one way, the other infinite number of ways are wrong. It's absurd. And then to go back to this idea of self-division, to use your example of like showing the Bentleys on social media and then having, you know, $3 million in debt, your, your energy is going in one direction. You're all this performative energy, but then the energy of authenticity, the energy of your emotion isn't there to hold up the energy of all this performance. And it is just, this is what leads to people feeling, get ready for this, exhausting, burnt out. What's at the extreme of being exhausted and burnt out? Depression. That is a hypo aroused state of the nervous system. So when we constantly reject our own emotional energy, we put ourselves in grave danger over time. Two more quick things. I mean, they're, they're kind of, the subjects are deeper than just being quick, but I want to make sure we cover these before we close. The first thing is there's a lot of talk about trauma now. And I, I think it's obviously very important to talk about it. I think it helps a lot of people. But you're a trauma expert and you've dealt with people that have gone through some some sincere trauma. Do you fear that the word trauma is becoming desensitized now because it's out there and everybody's kind of talking about it? Every person is now saying, well, it's, this, is, this must be trauma. This must be trauma. This must be trauma. When in reality, it, it might not be. Like, what are your thoughts on that? I have a lot of thoughts on this. I've been doing this work, working working with traumas for 20 some years or my, I come, depending on how you want to look at it, 20 some years or 40 some years. So that what's happening right now in the world of mental health, there's this incredible evolution going. So on one hand, I'm so excited and so um, hopeful about it. I think people are talking about mental health in a way that we never used to talk about mental health. I think this was expedited a lot by the pandemic and all the trauma that happened during that time. Whenever there's great evolution, there's also great chaos. So we're, I think people are trying to get their footing, right? Like a lot of our parents did not have language for some of the things that happened in their childhood and their life and their jobs. And so now we're, I, I, so I have a lot of generosity towards this. That being said, what I will tell you is energy begets energy. If I tell you today was really miserable, tomorrow's probably gonna be miserable. Things are really miserable. What's going to happen because of what's happening in my cognitive system and my emotional system is things are going to feel miserable. So if I say the world is really scary and the world is really scary and the world is really scary and the world is really scary, we do have to be mindful that like, how do we come to a place of power? Also, it's kind of what we said earlier in our conversation. If I really want to live the most powerful, peaceful, healed version of myself, I cannot wait for the rest of the world to join me. So even when the world is chaotic, how do I think in a healing, healthy way about self-trust? How do I hold myself accountable in a healed, healthy way? So to answer your question shortly, it's a both and. Like I, I first overwhelmingly think it's amazing that people are, are now starting to pay more attention to mental health. I think we're going through a growth process right now. I think also we know at every clinical disorder rumination is a problem. If I keep thinking about how sad I am and thinking about how sad I am and thinking about how anxious I am and thinking about, we know that th this ruminative feature does not typically lead people to feel better. So we also want to keep an eye on that as well. I love that. It's the second thing, and it's kind of adjacent to what we were just talking about, is a lot of times when people go through emotional pain, they want to not just like stuff it down and don't think about it. They want to be like, I want this to go away. I want my bad memories to, to leave me. I want this pain and grief from the breakup to go away right now. I want all this gone now, now, now. I know you think of emotional pain as the gateway to emotional power. Talk about why it's so important for people to not want to get rid of their pain, but instead harness it into some sense of empowerment. The easiest thing to say is you cannot, you cannot avoid the negative feelings. So chronic avoid when something bad happened, if there was a way when something bad happened to us to just not feel bad about it, and there, you know, there was no negative consequences, of course I would be an advocate for that. I'm not saying we should do hard things just for the sake of doing hard things. What I'm saying is the neuroscientific evidence is incredibly clear that when horrible things happen to us, if the only thing we do is avoid it, deny it, run from it, distract, 
pretend like it didn't happen. Do you know what happens? It sucks more and more of your energy. Why? Because, and there's, there's actual studies substantiating this. Avoidance is something that's coming from your brain. In other words, it's a very energy intensive thing to say, I think there's a monster in the closet, but I'm just going to throw my weight up against the door and make sure nobody opens this door. Just from an energy perspective, it's to say, let me take a deep breath. Let me surround myself with the resources I need to be able to open this door. And let me once and for all open the damn door and be done with it. Now, for a lot of us who have complex trauma, it's not a one-time thing, but the principle is the same. If I try to pretend a horrible thing did not happen to me, it does not make my nervous system and my body and my thoughts start behaving in a way that means the thing didn't happen to me. In fact, it just compounds dysfunction on top of dysfunction. So we talked a second ago about honesty. I want to be powerful in my life, meaning satisfied and confident and relaxed. I mean, I hope this makes perfect sense to people. I have to be willing to acknowledge the truth of my life. And when I acknowledge the truth of my life, then I have remarkable power to start directing it in the ways that I want to, instead of just reactively numbing out and running from it. Well, Dr. Julia, I wanted to thank you once again for for coming on the show and for sharing your wisdom and your expertise. I think people are going to get a lot of value out of this. So if people want to connect with you further, if they want to buy your book, Energy Rising, um, where's the best place to do all that? Yeah. So you can find me on all the social channels. I'm just Dr. Julia Deganji. So Dr. Julia Deganji on LinkedIn, Dr. Julia Deganji on Instagram. And you should definitely check out Energy Rising. It's a wonderful, lots of practical examples about how to work with difficult emotions and turn them into a source of empowerment. And you can get that on Amazon or Target or wherever you get your books from. Amazing. Well, I'll be sure to include the links to that stuff in the show notes. And for those listening, what I invite you to do is to share a takeaway. We talked about so much with regards to emotional pain. We talked about how to come to a place of emotional wholeness. We talked about self-betrayal. We talked about self-division. We talked about trauma. We talked about how to convert humiliation into worthiness. We've talked about so much. So what I invite you to do is to share your biggest takeaway, tag Dr. Julie and tag myself because we'd love to hear your feedback. We once again, thank you for listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and we'll see you next time.